we're in the second week of a series entitled Frame of Reference. And last week we saw how we all view life through a frame of reference. A frame of reference that has been shaped and influenced by our parents, teachers, culture and even your faith. It's your frame of reference that determines what you believe. It is your frame of reference that determines to some extent how you should behave and what we acknowledge is true. It is your frame of reference that determines for you right from wrong, just from unjust, important versus not so important, fair versus not fair. It is your frame of reference that determines what you believe. As we grow older, as we become more educated, as we have more experiences, as our faith grows, our view of life changes and so our frame of reference changes. For example, some of the behaviors that you might have indulged in when you were younger, you wouldn't want your children to do now. For some, it may have been an action that led to a criminal record. For others, in the rearview mirror of your life, there is a number of wrecked relationships. Some of your greatest regrets that you carry now at the time might have seemed okay. But today, with more experience and a new frame of reference, you view life differently. Isn't it true? In every season of life, as you learn and as you grow, your frame of reference changes. Our frame of reference is also limited by our upbringing and our experiences, the information we have at our disposal, the culture we find ourselves in. In last week's teaching, we saw how Jesus confronted some of those cultural mindsets in the people of the time, challenging their frame of reference. In the scripture portion we will look at this morning, we will see Jesus deliberately brings about a situation to change the disciples' outlook. To start with this morning, we're going to need to have a look at a little bit of geography and some history of the time to give us some background before we even get to the text. So the first part may feel a bit like a classroom. Stay with me and then when we get to the text, hopefully then it makes a bit more sense. If we look at a map of first century Israel, it's divided into three main provinces and each of the provinces seem to have a different expression of their faith in terms of Judaism. In the south, you have the province of Judea. Now, Judea was known for its traditionalists in terms of Judaism. They didn't want to change anything. They believed at the end of the period of the prophets, in terms of the scripture, there was no more prophecy. They believed at the end of the prophets, that was the end of healing. They believed there was no angels. They believed there was no resurrection. The Sadducees were Judeans. Slightly above Judea, you have the province of Samaria. Those were the people who had intermarried when the Assyrian captivity happened and had blended their religion with paganism. From a Jewish perspective, they were seen as syncretistic. They were the outcasts and hated. Samaritans and Jews never mixed. Of course, Jesus knew this. And in what is arguably his most famous parable, makes the Samaritan the hero, just like Jesus, to challenge their prejudices. And his encounter with the woman at the well takes place in Samaria at the town of Sychar. She's a Samaritan woman and he's engaging her as a rabbi. This would have been unheard of at the time. Then right next to this area, was the pagan territory called the land of the Decapolis, populated by the Greeks or the Gentiles who lived there in Jesus' day. What had happened was much earlier when Joshua drove out the pagan nations, we read in Joshua 3 verse 10, it says, and Joshua drove out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, the seven pagan nations. And they settled in an area later called the Decapolis. Jesus enters this region on more than one occasion and I want to look at one account today. Now the Decapolis was a group of 10 cities founded in 333 BC by Alexander the Great after he defeats the Persian Darius III in the Battle of the Issus River. Alexander was a military general, but Alexander's primary goal was not to conquer the world. It was to change the world. And he says that himself, how he wanted to change the world by getting people to become Hellenistic. And simply put, Hellenism is the view that the human being is the center of the universe, your mind, your body, and your creations. And he did it through focusing on four areas. Sports, he built gymnasiums and arenas. Arts and media, he built theaters. Education, he built schools and religion, he built temples. And his goal was to Hellenize the world through that. And he named those 10 pagan cities in this area the Decapolis. In Greek, deca meaning ten and polis meaning city. And so the Jewish rabbis referred to it as the land of the seven pagan nations. They also nicknamed this the other side and they called it a far country. Remember a younger son went to his dad and said, give me my portion of the inheritance. And the text says, and he took his inheritance and set off for a far country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. 
That's a parable. But as in many of Jesus' parables, Jesus uses places they would know. These cities were distinctly pagan. They were living completely apart from God's ways, pagan temples, pagan practices, gods of all kinds, immorality of every kind. They lived over there, and you would call it the other side. They also nicknamed this the land of the expelled ones, the people who Joshua had kicked out, the seven pagan nations. Now in Hebrew, the word for expelled or kicked out of school or divorced is garus. And to make a word plural, you add im to the end of it. So a group of people who had been kicked out are the gerusim. So it says in the scriptures in Mark chapter 5, Jesus crosses over the lake to the land of the gerusim, or translated gerasenes in our Bible. Not so much a place, but the land of the expelled ones, the land of the seven. It's the region of the Decapolis. Remember, this is also where Jesus encounters the demon-possessed man who was living among the tombs, and Jesus eventually casts the demons out into the pigs. That whole encounter takes place in this area, the Decapolis. So we have Judea in the south with the traditional Jews, above it Samaria, then across the Sea of Galilee, the region of the Decapolis, and then up in the north, we have the area of Galilee. As I've often mentioned, most of Jesus' ministry was spent around the Sea of Galilee, this area had the Orthodox Jews, mostly the Pharisees. After the Babylonian captivity, this part of the country was mostly empty. When Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel returned, they settled in Judea. They were traditionalists. Most stayed in Babylon. Why go back? Our country is still under Persia. Why exchange one Persian prison for another? So they stayed in Babylon. By the year 200 BC, it is estimated there were over 1 million Jews in Babylon and only 150,000, maybe up to 250,000 Jews in Israel. The Greeks then take over as the superpower, with Alexander the Great replacing the Medo-Persians. Then came the Maccabees. They rose up as revolutionary freedom fighters. They drove out the pagan people, the Seleucids who held them. The Jews were free for the first time since 586 BC. And those people in Babylon said, Let's go home. So in the generation between 167 BC to 64 BC, during the period of the Maccabees, it is believed more than 1 million Jews left Babylon and returned. Where did they move? Galilee is the only place with space. So they settled in Galilee, and they inhabited cities like Cana, Nazareth, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Magdala. These people were not traditionalists. They danced in the synagogues. They were known to raise their hands when they prayed. Their rabbis prayed for healing for the sick. They prophesied. In today's terminology, we might say that they were the Charismatics. Where did Jesus go? Jesus is a Galilean, not a Judean. He had 11 Galilean disciples. The 12th is from Judea. Guess who the 12th is? You guessed it, Judas. Judas is the only Judean disciple. The rest are all Galileans. Now there are three cities, Chorazin, Capernaum, Bethsaida. They are each about five kilometers apart. The Bible records most of Jesus' miracles were performed in Bethsaida, Capernaum, and Chorazin. If you add up all the teaching verses of Jesus in the entire Bible, more than 70% of Jesus' teaching happened in or next to those three cities. That is surprising. Jesus picked an area five kilometers by five kilometers by five kilometers, and he hardly ever left it. And what he did in that area, smaller than some suburbs, was change the whole world. Most of Jesus' ministry happens at Copernicum. It's referred to in the scriptures as his hometown. It was not a big city. But in their world, it was the Harvard, the Princeton, the Yale, the Oxford, the Rhodes. If you take the Mishnah, which is the record of Jewish thinking or scholarship, there are more quotes from the rabbis of that place, Copernicum, than all the rest of the rabbis of the world put together. Jesus didn't do his ministry in some backwater. Jesus did his ministry where the best thinkers of his time were. He was among the best of the best. And that changes one's thinking. It changed mine. We have all these pictures of Jesus carrying around sheep the whole time. Yet when you read the scriptures, Jesus is constantly challenging the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. He's challenging the thinkers, those who control the Jewish places of learning, the synagogues. Now one more thing before we get to the text. In Hebrew understanding, numbers have significance and are also symbols. And I'm not talking about Bible code stuff. Simply put, Numbers are always associated with certain qualities. So one is associated one God. Two, two tablets, the covenant tablets given to Moses. Three, as Christians we think Trinity, but think Jewish. 
three fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Four, the four mothers, Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah. Tough question, who were they in the scriptures? They are the mothers of the 12 tribes. Five is significant for the five, first five books, the Torah. Twelve, the twelve tribes, the people of God. Then one more. Fifty, Moses' division of the people. Fifty to a group representing accountability. Also fifty, Feast of Shavuot. Fifty days after first fruit harvest. And fifty year jubilee, the cancelling of debts. Now, four numbers in particular are really central to the existence of the Jewish people as a nation. Two, because of the two tablets, God's covenant with Israel. Five, the five books of Moses or Torah that define what a Jew was to be. Twelve, the community of God's people, twelve tribes. And fifty, accountability, the harvest festival celebration. We all know the story of Jesus feeding the five thousand. But where does that take place? In the Galilee region, what was known as the land of the twelve. It is the upper northwest corner. It is where all the Orthodox Jews lived. So they called it the land of the twelve, the land of God's people. How many loaves were there? Five. How many fish? Two. And when they were done, how many baskets left over? Twelve. And Jesus said to his disciples, have them divide up into groups of fifty. In terms of Jewish understanding, this passage is screaming. Jesus is the bread of life for the Jewish people. Two, five, twelve, fifty. In Jewish understanding, those numbers are a picture. They point to something. Now, a little later, when Jesus feeds another crowd, when Jesus feeds the 4,000, it's over on the other side of the Galilee, in the land of the seven. And so it's seven loaves and a few fish. Did they forget and not remember how many fish there were? No. There is no number given as it would not help the picture here. It is just recorded as a few instead of a number. Now we get to the text. Mark chapter 8, verse 22, and we read, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? Now this is a strange account of a miracle. Think about it. First off, why take him outside the village? Where did this take place? In the town of Bethsaida. This is one of the places Jesus does most of his ministry. It is a small fishing village. The ruins today look like this, not much to it. It had an estimated population of about 400 people. Which of the disciples came from Bethsaida? Philip, Andrew, Peter and Nathaniel. We know this because John specifically records this in his first chapter of his gospel. Four of the disciples are specifically mentioned as coming from this village. Why not just heal the man in the village? So Jesus takes this guy out of the village and then why can't he get the miracle right? It takes two turns. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. We all get hooked on Jesus spitting on the eyes, and so we don't look at the rest of the text. How come the man isn't instantly healed? Jesus is God incarnate. There is no way Jesus is just having a bad day and it takes him more than once to get something right. This is intentional. Let's see. So to better understand what is going on, we have to go back in the story. Remember when the scriptures were originally written, there were no titles, headings or even chapters. They were put in much later for convenience of reading. It makes it easier for us to navigate the scriptures. But what it also does is we normally just start where the heading is. So we started where it says Jesus heals the blind man. And we assume that is where the story started. But let's back up and find out what happened earlier in the story. It starts way back in the previous chapter, in chapter 7 and verse 31. It says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and who could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. So Jesus intentionally crosses the Sea of Galilee and goes into the region of the Decapolis. He heals a man who is deaf. And then it says, while he was there, a large crowd gathered. And since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Who are these people? People from the Decapolis, Gentile cities. Even after Jesus' resurrection, it would take two visions for Peter to go to the home of a Gentile. 
Here Jesus has them in this region saying, I have compassion on these people. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Imagine the scene. The disciples are part of the miracle. They had picked up the leftovers. After this, we're told, they get into the boat, they leave the area, and they're heading towards Bethsaida. Verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. They are thinking it's about not having any lunch. What are we going to eat? We read on. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? In today's language, Jesus would be saying, Are you still so dwarf? You picked up more than you started with, and now just a short time afterwards, you are wondering what you are going to eat. He says to them, you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear. And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied, relieved to know this answer. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. What is he saying? I am the bread of life for Israel's people, the twelve tribes. But I'm also the bread of life for those who live in the Decapolis, for the Gentiles, for the pagans. He said to them, do you still not understand? The boat gets to Bethsaida. He goes into the village and gets a blind man and brings him out to them outside of the town. This isn't a lesson for the town. This is a lesson for the disciples. He spits on the eyes. But the man can't see a thing. Jesus touches him again. And now it says his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. He could see everything clearly. Does he take two turns for God incarnate to get a miracle right? No. In this healing, the man gets his eyes, but he can't see clearly. The writer is going, boom, boom, boom. I want you to see this miracle with this blind guy is like a visual aid for the disciples. He shows the disciples their problem. They have eyes, but they cannot see. What good did it do to have those disciples at the feeding of the 5,000 and then to have them again at the feeding of the 4,000 and then straight afterwards sitting in the boat and they worried about lunch? They could just as well have skipped the miracles because it hadn't changed their outlook. You see, just like the disciples, we can find ourselves believing the text. You may believe the miracles happened, but if it doesn't change your outlook on life, what difference does it make? We worry about all sorts of things in life. Just as the disciples were unable to translate what they saw and believed in everyday life, so it can be with you and I. What good does it do to believe that Jesus heals, that Jesus can provide, that Jesus can restore, that Jesus can overcome evil, and then live your life worrying about everything? But it is the same Jesus who was able to turn a few loaves of fish into provision for everybody. It is the same Jesus who goes to the surgery room with you. It's the same Jesus who is there when you need healing. It is the same Jesus who gives you the wisdom and the answers you need for your dilemma. It's the same Jesus who says your father knows what you need, his eyes are on you. What good does it do for us as followers of Jesus to believe in miracles, to believe God is able to intervene into our situation and then live our lives with the same fears and worries? If we believe the truth of the text, it needs to change us. Also, following Jesus is always going to force you to face your fears, confront your prejudices and challenge your frame of reference. Jesus teaches this to his disciples by taking them to the region of the Decapolis and then by sort of healing a blind guy. I bet the disciples were thinking this is about us. Verse 25, once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. It is one thing to believe the text, but it is another to allow it to change your outlook, allow it to change your frame of reference. So may you let go of what would hold you back from reaching out to others. And may you embrace Jesus and the fact that Jesus' love and grace works for everyone, everywhere, regardless of their prior religious tradition. 
And may you be the kind of person who sees where God is at work in your city, in your place of work, in your family, and in your life. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we want to be more than just those who know the text, but rather those who live it out. We pray, Jesus, that you will come alongside us and touch us as you did that blind man. I pray that our eyes and our ears be opened and we will hear the urging of our Savior who comes to offer us a whole new way of seeing and doing life. Amen. Following are some questions you might like to consider if you're watching with a family member. It's an opportunity to discuss what the gospel passage highlighted. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bless you.